Are you like most sales and other professionals who want to grow their wealth faster than what they are currently doing through their company 401k, even with that company match, the stock market, or just plain saving money? Would you sleep better at night if you had the financial freedom to be job optional in just three to five years through investing in real assets? Maybe you don't want to stop working, but wouldn't it be cool if you could retire a decade earlier than most and do the traveling you and your family have planned for years while you're still young and can enjoy it? Let's face it, most busy professionals don't have the time or desire to take on more work outside of their W-2 to grow their wealth. On The Wealth Flow, each week we share the stories, the investments, and take a deep dive into the various asset classes that can deliver that accelerated growth to your portfolio passively. That's right, no extra work for you. Instead, we'll put your money to work. Learn what the 95% aren't talking about and join the top 5% of earners today on The Wealth Flow. All right, welcome to another episode of The Wealth Flow. And I am very excited today uh, with uh, our guest, Mr. Socket Jane. Socket, welcome to the show. Hey, buddy. Thank you. It's been, it's been a long coming. I was waiting for my invitation. Thankfully, <laughs> you invited me. That's right. Maybe got lost. Maybe got lost in the middle somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, yeah, glad we're finally able to, uh, to do this. Um, I think maybe what we can do, Socket, is um, you've got an amazing story. I can't wait to be able to share it with, uh, with our listeners um, but why don't we start from really the beginning, from uh, where you were born and kind of your journey uh, here to the to the states? Yeah, definitely. Let's do that, man. So, first of all, uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me. I'm excited to be part of this show and um, and share my story with your audience. Hopefully, we end up we add up some value. And if you don't see a value add, I'm sure you'll not release it. Um, right. So, if, if I see it being released, that means I added some value. <laughs> so I think to answer your question, it's a long story, but we'll squeeze it in. I, uh, if my accent, my name didn't go away, I grew up in India. Um, that's where I spent pretty much my entire adult, uh, entire young, young child and until I was like 22 or so. I was there, did my engineering, um, went to best, did anything, everything right, right? Kind of like how people say on, on paper, everything in my life was perfect in terms of my education. Uh, we didn't necessarily have a whole lot of money growing up, but my mom and dad, they put a lot of emphasis on me getting educated, um, which we'll talk about that at some point, some part in the show of why that's, how that is now showing up in my life yeah. of my, uh, my aspect of giving back. But when I came to this country, it's kind of interesting. I grew up in, I grew up learning English but I never was comfortable English with speaking English, with writing English, with do what, whatever to do with English. I, I avoided every single uh, aspect of not, if not being, having a chance to speak the, speak the language, although I understood it pretty well. So when I came here, I couldn't understand a single word, man. Uh, oh, wow. Uh, so I, I couldn't understand the accent. I couldn't understand the words. So I remember my entry into this country had two major cultural shocks. One was, uh, what my parents were telling me to learn English, I need to do that. I need to be able to speak and converse in it. Sure. The second is, is how I sound is how I'm going to be perceived. Right? So I worked very hard uh, to make sure that I would record voice messages for myself, leave it and replay it, and I hated it. I'm like, I can't even understand it. Forget about somebody else, and I was in pre-sale. I'm like, I don't even know how they hired me, but we got to do a better job on that, right? So <laughs> I just got a mission to make sure that I'm eighty percent understandable. Twenty percent, I may not be able ever to change because of my accent. It's, it's going to be what it is. Right. Um, and then also, a friend of mine told me if you want to understand the accent, you got to start watching uh, movies with subtitles on, and watch the same me same movie hundred thousand times. Right. Just kind of keep watching it. Repetition is going to force that accent. And that was one of the best advice, Keith, that was given to me. Wow. Because, uh, that's and that's really when, when I look back in life, anything in my life that I've taken something new that I've no experience in, I look at what somebody else is doing better than me. And I really listen to it, to pay attention to what they're doing and follow their footsteps, right? And through, through observation and through keen observation and through um, 
through really trying to make sure that I can I pay attention to what they're saying, I've I've realized that that is a skill that has helped me a lot of places, even in my consulting career. So when I came to this country, I came as a consultant, and quickly realized I am actually good at it. Uh, we were we were buying businesses, we were fixing it up for our, for our clients, and then selling them over, right? Uh, which we, I love. I love the thrill. I love the thrill of being part of the acquisition. I love the thrill of being part of the part of the process where we're fixing the projects and fixing the deals. And then I love the disposition of the assets as well. Okay. So that all worked fairly well. However, I gave up on one imp- most important thing of my life, which is time. Uh, time with my family, time with my, my dad was at that time uh, suffering from cancer. So I couldn't be there in India with him. It's the guilt of, uh, and I know you grew up in this country, so you may relate to it, you may not, the guilt of being an immigrant. That, um, that you left everything else, and yeah, your life is okay from what you wanted to build to it. However, there's there's really core pieces of your life that are missing now. Yeah, and uh, and that got that got even worse when I got laid off um, in 2016. I got laid off from a company, and for no fault of mine, because the company got merged and the division got wiped out. So now I'm like, you know, but now there's an existential crisis because I came to this country to work hard and make money and make a better life for myself. And I've sacrificed everything else uh, in pursuit of that. But now I'm at a stage, a crossroad where what I thought was my way out of everything is really not secure. It's really not safe. There's really no guarantees, right? right? And then around that time, my dad had passed away. So I'm like, okay, life's also fragile. So basically, you go to go through going through that phase. It was tough to go through it, but I'm glad I was able to come out of it. Right, which basically came upon to a point where I need to rethink how I'm living my life. I need to rethink my finances. I need to I need to take a better control and uh, take a, take a little bit more holistic approach to life and bring some balance. It's, it's never going to be fully balanced life. Sure. There's going to be ups and downs, but at least bring some more balance into it. So I went heavily on passive investing, real estate being the asset class of choice. Um, did that, was able to retire uh, from my last, most recent job was Airbnb. I was there for about five years, was able to retire in December. And now I'm basically a full-time syndicator, financial freedom advocate. I wrote a, one, of the, one of the best-selling books. I have a podcast um, and I'm enjoying my life. This is what this is what I was talking to one of my co- co-workers, ex-co-workers, and they're saying, "How's how's uh, last six months been?" I'm like, I get up in the morning, and I'm not hating my life. Yeah, so, yeah, that's amazing. I'm not hating my life. I'm doing what I love. I'm spreading the message. I don't have to worry about pleasing my boss. Um, and regardless of what stage in your life, there's always a boss. If you're not the boss, there's always a boss for you. For you're sure. You're always working on somebody else's back. I remember the first two months, man, we had no alarms in the house. We'd get up at whatever I want to get up. Uh, I'll do what I'm mean, that 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 weirded me out pretty quick because I'm like, I'm wasting my life. So yeah. I'm not that guy. So then I got back on the horse and kind of making sure that what I need to build build a productive life. We went we went kind of on that road at that point. So I now threw a lot at you, Keith, and your listeners. So I'm going to take a quick pause. Otherwise, I can fill up the entire hour. You know that. (laughs) That's right. Uh, So I'm going to stop. (laughs) (laughs) I'll tell you what. uh, There's a lot to unpack uh, there. I think, um, what age were you when when you uh, came to the U.S.? 22. 22. Okay. And you you mentioned that uh, you um, were a consultant. Uh, Were you a a consultant right off the bat? Um, I was. I came... I came where uh, at that time there was I don't know if you remember the whole Y two K that yeah. was happening around that yeah. time, mm-hmm. right where there was a lot of uh, requirement for IT professionals in this country to kind of making sure that we don't we don't collapse the systems don't collapse so that was the that was a leverage I used to come here okay. but then quickly moved into management consulting so I had a job I didn't come here just because I wanted to come I wanted to make sure that I come here to stay, right? So, but I needed a source of income um, and job seemed the right thing to do at that time. Of all the looking back, uh, there are multiple ways to do it, but that's a path I put at that time. Sure. And, you know, uh, your story, um, wow, it's got 
it, it's unique. It's uh, it's also kind of common in the sense that you hear a lot of folks that do an amazing yeah. job here in the U.S. just making an amazing life for themselves, but yet they you know they they start. What, what do you think? Some of the why? Where do you think that perspective change or maybe mind shift shift uh, comes from? Because you know you look at uh, a lot of folks and myself included uh, here in the U.S. and just you know. Um, we don't always take full advantage of uh, the opportunity that's in front of us. And I think it's somehow easier for an immigrant to, uh, uh, to see. Yeah. So I think there's, it's, it's a multiple part question. So let's, let's, let's take it one layer at a time, right? So I think one of that is, if we're talking about somebody who grew up in the U.S. versus somebody who didn't grow up in the U.S. So when you're growing up in the U.S., if you look at our education system here, and I'm part of that now because my kids go to schools here, if you really look uh, look deeper into the education system, it is an assembly line. Yeah, it's teaching you to be compliant. It's teaching you to conform. It's teaching you to do good. And what the way to define good is to being rewarded for something that the teacher wanted from you, right? Sure. Um, the school's really preparing us to be. If you have passed out of school, chances are you're going to be a great worker. Yeah. Um, right. So, because that's what they're training you for. Right? I mean, if you look back on how the schooling system started, it really started from the point of view of what can we train the kids of today to be a successful contributor to the society tomorrow. Yeah. Um, and all of the curriculums are, even now, if you think about AI being a very hot topic, now the schools are teaching AI, ML, right? They're teaching coding. Now, 20 years ago, 40 years ago, it may not have been the case, but now... If you are trying to go into the startup world and you don't understand AI or ML, you'd be looked differently, right? So sure. you're, you're basically preparing the young minds to make sure that they understand how to fit and how to conform. So really, if you think about it, and what's happening from there is, why is that happening? Because if you look back on economics of supply-demand, right, if the the way the parents are understanding the success of a child is my child works at Google, my child works at Facebook, my child works at XYZ ABC company, which happened to me as well. So there's no, I'm not saying it's wrong or right, but to answer your question, as a parent, we're also pushing our kids to do well in that system. Yeah. So what they're learning is to being in the system that you've been trained to be is the right thing to do. And then we start using the words, job is safe, right? You mm -hmm. have your 401k, you will retire. Oh, we're, we're subconsciously or consciously shaping the future of future gen recurrent generations mind to be a conformed employee tomorrow, right? Some of us have the, either because of the life situations or because that's how we're built, we're able to break out of it. Yeah. Most of us end up getting stuck in that. Right, like I remember, my mother-in-law asked me a question when I was thinking of quitting. She's like, "Why are you always fighting the system?" I'm like, "I can't fight the system. I'm too small to fight the system. I'm just developing my parallel system, which is going to depend on the current system, but not entirely. That's really what it is. I'm not saying the current system is wrong. It's just not working for me. Yeah, right. I need to take advantage of the current system, what it, what I can. But that doesn't mean I can't have my own small ecosystem where we're all we're all thriving to to do our best." while depending on the current system, because I can't really build a new economy. That's not, that's not my goal to begin with. My goal is to be free, whatever that means, and everyone has to define that. Now, the second part is your, your second part of your question was, why is it easy for an, uh, for an immigrant versus uh, somebody who grew up here? Right. I don't think it's easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Easy is probably not the right word. So yeah, right. so if I said easy, so, I don't, it's not easy. It's just, it, it seems that they, they're more immigrants are able to do that versus uh, versus resident Americans, correct. right? Yep. So I think the and this is my hypothesis. I'm no uh, psychology student, so I can't really or a behavioral psych psychologist. So I think that what I would say is that when you leave and what, the way I define immigrant is actually much and you know that much broader. I don't look at immigration as physical migration, right? Right. I look at immigration as you're moving from your current reality to a new reality. If you, move, if you switch a job, you're an immigrant. 
Yeah. If you enter into a relationship, you're an immigrant because your current reality shifts and you become you have to become something different, right? Whenever that phase happens, at that there's a moment in time where your current mental model breaks. Nothing about is true. For me, speaking the Indian language was my reality. When I came here, I had to shift completely. And if I wasn't ready to shift, I may not see the success that I have today, right? And when you are in that mode of being very, very uncomfortable, you don't have a mental model that you need to adhere to. You're trying to figure out the question you're asking yourself is, how can I make my place in this in this new environment that I've put myself in? So you're looking for that answer. Now, depending on when you came, what kind of migration you you're going through you may still have a familiarity around it because you've seen it like for example we're talking about getting into a relationship and getting married um you have seen your parents your friends or whatever there's a mental model that you're carrying through but for the for the amount of drastic migration that some of the immigrants do which is leave a country where they'll probably won't see for next 5 7 years and there's not a lot of people they know here you're really in a completely new zone and that being in that uncomfortable environment i believe it pushes you to learn skills that you've never done never learned before nobody knows you so you have a chance to reinvent yourself you can be whoever you want to be right yeah. uh because there's not there's no baggage involved at all and we're in that process i think you start seeing things differently because your your mind is not saying i need comfort i need security your mind's thinking how can i find what i was looking for so you you have a different set of eyes to to perceive the world from i think that's really where the power is and hence my show which is migrate to wealth is really about look at wealth from a different from a migrant's perspective and i'm never talking about physical migration i'm talking about when you're moving from one comfort area to something that you're uncomfortable with because that's a moment and we should not waste that moment that's the moment we should realize to to go deeper into that question and make sure that we can transform ourselves not change transform because change means there's still elements of you which is true transformation would mean you you become you come out of it as a completely new person that's the goal right yeah now some of us can do better than the others and i think that's what happens when when we start questioning when something bad happens in your life and you lost when you lost a job or when i lost a job or when somebody else has um a loved one pass away those are the moments now you're again moving into the migrant mindset where you have to migrate from your current reality to a new reality and that's that's usually ends up being a most defining moment in your life because that's where you're most vulnerable you have no support system and you're asking the questions um that is probably going to give you a, put, put it you in a path which is a very different path Yeah that's great. Um I love I, I love the comparison, I love the analogy of uh it not just being moving from a you know one one country to another. Um I think you got a great point there. Um and I can see how um the point that you made about you know you have an opportunity almost like a blank canvas to recreate yourself. Um yeah. I I can see the uh the, some of the advantages of uh of that. Well good. Thank you. You'll call me crazy. I am I am an addicted migrant. Um uh, that, that's a self that's a self-proclaimed title. And right. I'll tell you why. Sure. I've been in this country. I came here in 2000. It's now 2023. In 23 years I've changed 25 addresses. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. It give you a perspective of how much I love change. Not because I like to, I hate moving, but I love change. Yeah. Because change is where the growth is right and my way of pushing myself to change is to really redefine reinvent if you go back to any of my friends one of the one of the things that you can consistently hear from them is you never know with saket what he wants to do next because something when you think when you think everything is stable something else will happen and you'll see a new version right so i love that process man i love the process of redefining myself I have to be careful I've I have two kids now uh who are 7 <laughs> and 9 they're getting to a point where they may not love the change as much as I do right I, uh, my wife and I love change like we were, we just moved to Raleigh my wife was asking me the other day I think we should move to Florida 
I'm like, <laughs> I don't know if it should move yet. Uh, but let's figure it out. You you ask me, I should pack the bags and move. I'll do it tomorrow. Right. But let's just make sure we're 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 able to do that. Yeah, yeah. No, that's great. <laughs> that's very interesting. Yeah, no, it's cool. That's a that's a ton of different places. Yeah. Really yeah, uh, and that know, doesn't mean it's different states. It's just even within the states, man, you don't need you don't need to drastically change your life. You can find change, change your habit, change your ecosystem, change your network, change your jobs, uh, start something new, a new habit. All these things are going to push you in a direction where you're not comfortable with. For sure. Yeah, and it's almost like uh, just by doing it, even as something as simple as a new move, it's kind of a muscle, right? So, you know, adjusting, whether it be changing careers, whether it be doing something different, it's a, it's, it's kind of a muscle. And if you've, you've done it before, you know, you can do it again, you know? So yeah. it, it's actually an interesting um, social experiment that we did with ourselves, right? So uh, my wife loved her stuff, which could be, it could be a painting, it could be a kitchen utensil, it could be that. And I never had attachment to it, anything. Um, because I always, I came to the country with one, one suitcase, right? So for me, that's always the mindset. Well, it's fine. Uh, that's all I came with. If that's all I have at the end, that's perfectly fine. Right. Um, but of course she grew up here and she had a very different perspective of life. Um, and I think we were talking the other day, these, a lot of these moves, how much our hard these moves are, we have constantly purged crap from our life. Yeah. Be it people, be it stuff be it emotions, be it relationships that we didn't want in our lives, right? Whatever it is, it's a time to purge. And also, not just the outside, but even us. We could redefine, oh, you didn't like the way you were perceived in D.C.? Well, you're in Raleigh now. Nobody knows you. Yeah, yeah. And you have the choice to change it now, right? So that gives you a sense of freedom. The first few times we did it, it was pretty hard. It was pretty hard because we're like, oh, we're losing our friends. We have this. But now it's really, I think you put us in any environment now, including our kids. Um, you'll figure it out now. Right? Yeah. So that change gives you resiliency. But I also understand, I don't want to say sound like you should keep moving. There's a, there's a beauty to have some security and stability, stability as well. Right? Each, each of us will have to pick our own um, slider, how, how far on that spectrum you want to be on each side most of us are over pivoting on security, which is probably why you'll see the growth is not happening, right? And that's what, that's what my message is. At least go towards the change, if not embrace the change like me. You may want to be closer to the change, closer to the middle. If you're all the way on the left side of the spectrum, which is security, um, you may not you may not see a lot of growth. You may be very living a mediocre life, right? Because sure. all of us have tremendous potential, and that's really where each of each of us will have to find it. That's why the podcast is. That's why I know our conversations have been of how do you push yourself? Exactly. Yeah. No. Um, what about? Uh, tell me a little bit about uh, Airbnb. Um, I know you you spent some time. Were you where, there before they went public? I forget uh, exactly what. Yeah. Yeah. They actually, I I joined them in 2017. Okay. Uh, and I was they went public in December 2020, right in the thick of COVID. Oh wow! Um, okay. So yeah, I was there. I was there throughout. I just left in December 2022. Um, so it's fairly new that I left. I was in multiple divisions there. I was managing their uh, strategy and operations for one of the divisions that you may not even heard. Most people have not heard of. It's called. Uh, it was called Luxury Retreat. It was an acquisition, uh, which was merely focused on twenty thousand dollar a night bookings, right? Uh, oh, wow. Private beaches, beautiful homes, beautiful homes. Um, sad part when before the acquisitions, all the employees of Luxury Retreat were given free one week accommodation in anywhere they had the property. The wow! Moment we acquired them. The moment they even acquired them, that that benefit went up. I'm like, shoot, <laughs> uh, that would have been great. Right, a twenty thousand dollar vacation. Uh, for sure. For. Yeah. So, anyways, I did that. I did a bunch of other things. We were part of the um, Airbnb had sponsored Olympics. Um, I think they were still the current sponsors. All the during the COVID, everything got messed up. Um, so I was managing the the financials and the business operations for that. 
And then most recently, I was uh, part of the biz ops from the sales end. Okay. Uh, business operations. But along this side, I knew this is all temporary now because that's the muscle I had developed. Um, that That's the... That's the promise I made to myself. Doesn't matter what kind of job I have next or I don't have a job. I'm going to not let anyone control my financial future. Yeah. Uh, right. Because in that, so we were always investing along the side. Um, I was buying, buying and, and investing in multifamily apartments. But since then, after I've, after I've quit, of course, the portfolio has expanded. I have a venture capital fund now with my love for startups. I just love that world. So uh, and I've been investing in venture in startups for probably over ten years now, ten to fifteen years. Wow! Uh, so that that made a lot of sense. And then also I have a portfolio, a fund right now that's talk that's we're acquiring Airbnbs in Memphis and on the on the uh, Southern Virginia. Yeah, tell me a little bit more about that. I know um, you, you shared that uh, opportunity with uh, with me, and it seems like mm-hmm. a, a really a really neat uh, neat opportunity. And with your background, wow, you bring a yeah, ton. To exactly, it. Well, might as well. I think I I know a few things about Airbnb. I I, I should. Um, mm-hmm. So I think the, our our hypothesis there is that there's a supply constraint, right? Airbnb, and it's public news that we need five million hosts as of last year. Um, there's a lot of hosts needed in the in the in the Airbnb because the demand of the Airbnbs are not going down. But within Airbnb, I look at Airbnb as an as an aggregation of multiple sub asset classes. You could pick these twenty thousand dollars a night. Mm-hmm. You could pick the beach homes. You could pick these uh, beautiful single family homes for a single family for one family. You could pick apartments or duplexes, which is for traveling professionals. You can go so many different slivers of demographics and focus areas, or you can go smoky mountains, right? Smoky mm-hmm. mountains has been pretty hot. So you can try and figure out where you want to be. Uh, and depending on where you want to be, there's going to be a market that's going to serve you well. So most people are looking, I was talking to somebody last week about it, that most of the investors are picking what's the hot market. And that's a question. Right. I think the real question is, I want to serve this as serve this demographic. What's the best market for this demographic? Whatever your demographic is. And again, most of us are looking at the question incorrectly because when we're saying what's the hottest market, is say you're basically saying where am I going to make the most amount of money? Yeah. Right? Um, and then then you then you go into another level of deep, level of question. What is what is the amount of money? Are we talking about cash flow? Or are we talking about appreciation? Right. And when you start going that round, it's going to tell you your relationship with your money, which is, which is a very important thing to know, as in, are you, are you jumping on it because Airbnb is hot um, and you, you believe that the revenue potential is higher there um, and the cash flow and appreciation is going to be great, right? Or you're jumping in it because you think there's a, there's a demand, there's a specific demographic and their demand is not ending. Yeah. Right? For example, traveling nurses. That's yeah. a great, the, the lack of healthcare professionals is not shifting anytime soon. So depending on which markets you book, it may not be the hottest market from however you define hot market, but it may be a demographic that's going to give you a consistent stream of income, which is what's going to buy you your freedom, right? Which comes back to the next question of when you're looking for an Airbnb, are you looking for cash flow or are you looking for net worth? Are you trying to increase your balance sheet or are you trying to, are you, are you trying to smoothen out your cash flow? Um, and I don't, I, know, I don't know your listener base, where they are in their journey. I'm assuming a lot of them are still trying to figure out how to get their freedom back. So the way to earn your freedom from your nine to five is not net worth, it's not balance sheet, it's cash flow. Right. right? So the question now you're asking yourself is, where can I get cash flowing Airbnbs? And once you ask that question, the answer is going to be very different than what's the hottest market. Right. Yeah. Sometimes the hottest uh, market, sometimes the hottest market too is saturated, right? So it's like, you know, yeah. you, you and every other investor under the sun wants to be there exactly. and eventually it gets, you know, over. Uh, and it's kind of funny when we, when we launched our fund, we were looking to go into Norfolk, Virginia, and uh, we couldn't find any properties. And we quickly realized we picked such a great market. We can't find anything there, yeah. right? Which is not which is not a good market for what we want to do. Yeah, it's a great market if you already own something there, 
But if you try, if there's no inventory, you can sit and wait at that. Or what we did was we pivoted to Memphis yeah. because we had boots on the ground in Memphis, and that's a, that's an exceptionally great market as well for our needs. Right. Anytime I talk on the show, I want to make sure that I'm not giving you an advice of which market is good, which market is bad, because every market is good and every market is bad, depending on what demographic you're trying to serve. For sure. Yeah, I actually um, just happened to have a call this morning and uh, we ended up the conversation was all around short term rental. Uh, yeah. It was the three of us and we had we all have them. And uh, one of the things I thought was really interesting, um, there's a gentleman who actually co-host one for another uh, family. He's got the one next door under contract for himself. Uh, nice. But I asked him about it. I said, what, you know, what part of Florida? He's got another one out in, uh, near, near Disney. Um, but this one isn't. And it was near kind of a nature uh, preserve. But he said, you know what's very interesting in hosting it for somebody else? I get tons of traveling nurses. And Correct. so- you know, there's right. a hospital there that's underserved and uh, there's a great opportunity um, there. So talk about, you know, less turnover because they're going to stay a little longer than your average guest that's there right. for vacation, less cleaning fees. Uh, so really uh, some some kind of neat, neat, neat information. Well, right. I think I think that's where that's where uh, even my friends are like, oh, what's the should I go buy? And also the way people are looking at the deals. Right. So it's an imperfect world. There's no no one database. I know AirDNA is pretty popular, uh, but if you ever has have owned a property in Airbnb, you'll realize AirDNA is not perfect. Right. No database is perfect. No databases. So how do you start? Uh, how do you underwrite the deals? And then what's the risk? Are you willing to take the risk? I know a friend of ours is trying to buy a ten unit or 12, 12 bedroom uh, beach house right in front of the beach and. Um, in our portfolio, we have the possibility of potentially buying that to further diversify our demographic as well. And I was showing him some numbers. He's like, these numbers are not real. I'm like, what do you mean? They're not real. They're like, they're not the right numbers. And we started digging into it. It realized he actually didn't know how to underwrite anything. Right? Mm, oh, wow. He was looking at the numbers in a way where, you, where an untrained investor is going to look into. Right? So having part, being part of a fun, being part of a conversation that you just had in the morning, that's when you want to make sure that you're protected on the downside and you've looked at everything. Now, that does not mean analysis paralysis. I think there's a fine line between spending 15 months on underwriting a deal versus two minutes. Right. right. There's, there's somewhere in between where there's going to be a sweet spot for depending on the deal you're looking at. And uh, but you need to look at the numbers the way it should work, and most of the folks are looking at rehabbed Airbnbs. The, the value is already gone. If, if basically somebody else has already picked the cherry on the top, right? Yep. So you have to figure out how much where the where the value really resides, and are you willing to do the work if you're trying to make that as a business, if you're trying to scale them, if you're buying it as a lifestyle investment. Hey, me and my wife, or me and my husband. We want to go hang out on the summer vacations. Might as well get an Airbnb. That's a very different strategy. Sure. We're not talking about that specific strategy because then your emotions are going to overpower your financial uh, wherewithal, which is perfectly fine. Again, that's all. there's a place for doing that. But if you're looking for an investment and trying to get freedom out of it, you have to make sure where the numbers make sense, not really where the emotions make sense. No, that's a great point. Um, yeah, anything, right? Being val value add. There's the, right off the bat, you're, you're coming in with equity uh, once you've done those right. improvements, right? So, uh, yeah, makes 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 a lot of sense. Um, you know, on that same subject, you've got uh, you know just tremendous experience here. But I wanted to maybe see if you could talk a little bit about like a lot of our listeners. They're sales professionals. They're high paid. They, they know of the, the company 401k, not to say that they don't know about real estate, but oftentimes it's right. like, gosh, I don't have time for that, or I don't want to clean toilets, or I don't want to do this or that. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, you know, investing in a fund similar to yours and how important it is to have, you, know, uh, you, you mentioned it in your, in your response, um, how important it is to have the right people on the team? Correct. Correct, correct. So I think, uh, actually, before we answer that question, let's, let's go a few steps back. So there are three ways to invest in anything. One is you want to go by yourself with your own capital. 
um, as a down payment if you want to put leverage on it. The second is you partner with your friend, right? Where two of you are doing it by yourself. The third is you are partnering with somebody who actually knows it as a, and doing it as a business. Three ways, right? So the, the method that you're talking about with the fund and everything else is really about investing with somebody who already knows how to do that because they've already crossed the learning curve. They've already made their mistakes. They already have the team in place. They already have the processes in place. Um, so they have the leverage that, they, that, that with minimum amount of effort, you can get started. Now, what that, what, how we define in our world, Keith, is passive investing. It's right. really mailbox money where you continue to making your money because if that's what you like to do, you should continue making your money uh, as a sales professional. No one's saying you should quit your job today. But use that money that you are that you're buying that, that you're gaining from your income to basically um, add it to your uh, passive investing uh, vehicle where you're buying things on the side where you the hardest decision you have to do is, which investment and which 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 deal to invest passively in. But once you've made that decision, you can ride the wave out to make sure that you have consistent cash flow as long as you pick the right deal and the market supports it. Um, you're getting a mailbox check, or not only a mailbox check because nobody sends checks anymore, but you're getting this magic wires. money appear in your wires or ACHs appear in your bank accounts um, almost on a quarterly, monthly, or some some level of period, periodic basis, whatever the deal is supposing. It's important to do that. Here's why, right? And uh, when, you, when you're trying to grow your wealth, there are two components into it. We're going to physics equation, mass times velocity, right? So in that, in that equation, mass is really about the amount of money you can pour in. Mm -hmm. And velocity is... How soon can you multiply the money? How fast your money is growing, right? So mass is really the input, which is which is your current reality, and velocity is what you can, uh, what you can, how how fast your money is growing, right? How fast is doubling, tripling, quadrupling? So when you look at these two, you may find the perfect deal today, but if your cash flow from your income or other aspects has gone dry, that one deal is going to take a time to multiply it. For sure. Um, but if you have the capital coming in through your jobs, now what you're doing is I have I have an income coming in, and if I structure my life properly, I have I can invest in more deals, which are multiplying at the same time, right? So you see these parallel appreciation opportunities and parallel cash flow opportunities, which are all going to materialize at different time spans, or at same time span, depending upon how you picked and where the market is, right? That's really where the value of making sure and what's going to happen is in no, in a very short amount of time, it may seem pretty large, in a very short amount of time, within five to 10 years, your cash flow, depending upon the deal you picked, and if you picked it right, and again, if the market serves you well, um, you're going to see the cash flow from these investments exceed your current expenses. Yeah. At that point, you have, you have achieved the first level of financial independence. Right, and that's why it's important. Now, you could say that I'm going to quit my job today, like Saket or others, other people like that, and I'm going to go full blown into syndications, and I'm going to full blown. I'm going to go find deals and make money and all that stuff, which is all good. You can do it, but you want to have that initial level of freedom because the risk of doing it actively when you have no experience in doing it is pretty high. Right, I've lost a lot of money. So have other syndicators. I've lost a lot of money but I've lost a lot of my money. Right. right. I'm okay with that because that's my risk to take. But once you start taking money from somebody else and also helping them to invest alongside you, when you start losing their money because of your lack of experience, um, I couldn't sleep with that thought, right? So I wanted to make sure that I make all the mistakes on my money. And then once I get, once I get to a point where, because uh, you're going to make mistakes no matter what. It's not a matter of if you're going to make mistakes, you're going to make a mistake. Right, uh, and a lot of these mistakes are because of the unknowns, right? That you have, so that's going to happen. So you're trying to prevent that. So what, what, where we're going with this whole story is, it's important to use your current income source as a way to get you to the first level of freedom. 
And once you get that, you have a fork in the point at that fork in the road at that point. Do you want to continue doing the passive or do you want to switch into being active? Right. Right. Now, there are multiple ways. A lot of things a lot of folks may think about and say, now, it may not be true for most sales professionals that I don't have a lot of income. I don't have a liquid cash, which you started going that route, which is 401k. Right. Right. So right now you have money in 401k from old jobs. You have IRA money. Um, you have other sources, which is, again, the conformity principle where you, we have been told at our jobs that we can't use the money in our IRA or our financial advisors that you can't use your money in IRA and 401ks to invest in anything but stocks and bonds. Right. Right. Which is the biggest lie ever because you can. You have to do, you have to do some restructuring. And there's a show, I can't remember the episode number on mine. I recorded with Matt Sorensen. He's a directed IRA company, a mm-hmm. great, great, great podcast, which gives you a, a perspective on how to invest, how, how to, how to find capital when you thought you had none yeah. to invest in passive opportunities, right? That's really the theme where you don't necessarily need to make $500,000 a year. If you are great, because you have now more mass, mass time velocity, you have more mass uh, to bring to the table and you just need to make sure your, your velocity is, is, is at the right point as well. So I don't know if that answered your question, Keith. I, I know I've probably got a little bit longer than you'd expected, <laughs> but if uh, we can go, we can go deeper in any question there, uh, any, any point there. No, I think it does. Um, it, you, you covered, you know, what I, what I was asking there. What about though? Um, so obviously, uh, with the investment that you have on the Airbnbs, but also I know you've done all several uh, multifamily syndications. Yeah. What is it? Just kind of staying on this topic of uh, paying a passive investor. What what's the hold time frame for some of these things? And uh, obviously, market conditions can change some of that, of course, and you know, there's no guarantees, but uh, what kind of expectation from an income standpoint uh, can someone have? Um, you know, you mentioned uh, a minute ago about uh, whether to buy something actively or um, passively. And, you know, what the example that always comes to my mind is like in San Antonio, the average price house, you're looking at 300000 If you're going to yeah. buy it as an investment, you're going to be putting down 20%. So now you're up to $60,000. A lot of these mm-hmm. opportunities are, you know, minimum of $50,000 investment. Yeah. Obviously there's some other hard assets you can do for even less, but um but that's kind of the typical buy-in, uh 50 to 100 mm-hmm. and um yeah. So, you know, r- right off the bat, uh you're spending more if you're trying to do it on your own, not including all those mistakes and the time yeah. that you have to allocate. I, I think people confuse, so th- before we go the the numbers, people confuse comfort as control, right? Um, because what they're, what they're saying is, um, and I have several friends who do that, uh, so I have first-hand experience in that, that I like control, right? And that I want to buy my own properties, I don't want to um, invest in a passive deal. So, so then you start going deeper, like, okay, so what about control do you like? Like, I can sell the property when I want to, right? When you're investing in a passive deal, you're depending on somebody else to make that decision when they, what happens at the property, uh, when they exit, and all that good stuff, right? Um, sure. There's a specific person that I have in mind that I had a long conversation with, a very good friend. I've known him for over 30 years now. Uh, I'm like, you know what, that's perfectly fine. If you want to do that, you should do that. That was five years ago. He has not done anything. Hmm. Right, he's not wow. invested in anything because the inertia involved in going to find your own deal and negotiating it and closing it, the inertia is so high that while it, the while in your fantasies it's a great idea, in your dreams it's a great idea, it's a great passion, and yes, it'll work. The problem is you have to you have to also be real with yourself. Do you really have the time to do that? Right. So then we look at your question, which was more about passive versus active, the returns. If you think about, uh, a tri- and, and these deals change, right? Depending on what times you're in right now, the interest rates are higher, so the cash flows are lower. Right. So we'll talk about in today's market, and if you can compare it to the la- last two, two years, we'll do that as well. If you can, in, in now time, you've, you, have, you, have, you have four components in any real estate deal. So you have the tax benefits, you have the cash flow component, you have the principal pay down in your, in your loans, and the last thing, you have an appreciation. These are the four different ways you make money in real estate. 
that's why it's very powerful because most most investment vehicles won't offer you these four. Right? So um, and that is immaterial of active versus passive. So what the what the only component we're talking about right now is cash flow, and the hold times, right? So the hold times are usually nowadays it's about three to seven years. Right. When I say that, it's probably going to change as the as we see the interest rates coming down. But right now, if somebody's telling you they can they can change, they can flip the property, which essentially means they can do whatever they need to do and sell it within the first two to three years. Don't even look at that deal because they don't know what they're talking about. At this point, it's too risky, right? Uh, because you don't know where how much time is going to take the interest rates to stabilize and come down. It's going to come down. It can't stay at this level for too long. So when that happens, the cash flow is going to go up. But right now, if you can get about six to seven ish percent of cash flow, uh, it's actually a deal worth looking into. About two or three years ago, we were we were getting about 10, 12, 13 percent cash on cash, right? Because the interest rates were low, and it's a simple math. If the debt is higher, your cash flow is going to be lower for the same right. amount of net, net operating income and everything else, right? So, and the whole times are there. But what you're really looking for is in the next, in, by the time this property gets disposed in two years, three years, five years, whatever time frame it is, what's the equity multiple? That's the most important number. And then you have to figure out what portion of that equity multiple is coming from cash flow through operations versus appreciation, because that'll give you a perspective of how risky the deal is. If you're banking on appreciation, that's that's a gamble. Yeah. Right? And you have to know going and you have you have to know going in that this is this is more of a gamble than an investing. If over six fifty to sixty percent of your uh, equity multiple is coming from operations, you know it's about cash flow, right? And most deals are gonna be in between the two, right? Some are gonna be more cash flow heavy, some are gonna be more appreciation heavy, and some are, some of them are gonna be right in the middle 50 50. And then you have to make that determination for yourself. But the equity multiples we're seeing right now is about 1.7 to 2 Okay. on the conservative side, right? And when I say conservative, not a fancy marketing word. You have to really understand what conservative underwriting is. Like I was talking to one of my friends. They were saying, oh, you know what? My cash flow from this property is 15%. I'm like, how? Help me understand that. This, this, this is amazes me when you're, talking, when you're talking to investors and they say that, they're like, oh, I have tax benefits that I've encountered into it. I have principal reduction that I've encountered into it. And I have all the other expenses that I'm, I'm like, so you're basically saying that even though your cash outlay is more, all the phantom money that you have, depreciation, tax benefit, and principal, which you don't see today, you may see the benefit of it, who knows when, if for taxes, you may see it in a year or you may see it in 10 years, depending on how you did the depreciation schedules. Sure. So now you're, now you're just doing a financial engineering on yourself. It's not really cash flow. When we're looking at cash flow is if you put in 100K every year, every, if you put in 100K, how much are you getting today? Not accounting for tax, tax, tax benefits, not accounting for depreciation losses, not talking about uh, principal pay downs. Not talking about appreciation, pure and pure cash flow game, right? Mm -hmm. That's really where you want to be in, because if yeah, yeah, you may get some tax benefits and your principal benefits, but you're not seeing that money today. And going back to our previous premise, cash flow equals freedom, All right? That cash flow doesn't exist because depreciation is a phantom loss; it doesn't exist. So you're not able to enjoy that cash, right? Now you can you can you can feel good about it, which is great. But if the goal is cash uh, freedom through cash flow, that is real, real cash. And now what, it's kind of funny when my friends, what he does is he pays up all, all the rental properties he has. I'm like, have, he's like, yeah, I have $2,000 coming in every month. I'm like, but how much money have you put in? And he's like over $500,000. I'm like, do a cash flow analysis on that. Your return <laughs> on your numbers, you're feeling good about making $2,000. Yes, you've gained your freedom, but is the velocity of money working in your favor? That's why I like this mathematical equation because I'm like, uh, your growth has two components, mass and velocity, right? They both have to work. And velocity is how fast your money is making money. If you're, if you're blocking your $500,000 to make $2,000 a year, $2,000 a month in net cash flow, that's a crappy deal. Right. <laughs> There's, because there are better deals available in the market. Your returns are sub two. Right, yeah. um, and you have money in the account for maintenance and vacancies and all that good stuff. 
So that, that I, again, it's every answer is a long-winded answer with me. So uh, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully these make sense to you. We can we can always synth- distill it and synthesize it. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, and uh, no, it does. You've, you've thrown out some amazing nuggets. You, we talked a little bit at the beginning of the show uh, about whether or not we'd bring some value, and I think uh, you've definitely delivered on on that. Um, All right. Socket, how about, um, I, I know um, you you do some uh, nice philanthropy stuff uh, with uh, some of your investments and different things. Can you talk a little bit maybe about that and then uh, we can kind of talk about how people can find out more about you? Yeah, definitely, Keith. So, um, and we, we, I touched a little bit briefly about that at my, during my introduction, uh, about education. Education mm-hmm. has been very important to me because I don't think you and I would be talking if my parents didn't invest in my education, right? Um, I would be living a different life. Uh, good or bad, yet to be seen. I, I don't think I will ever know that. Right. But a different life for sure, right? So when I look at, um, there's still, and I'm only talking about India, that doesn't mean it only exists in India. It exists everywhere. Um, there's a lot of kids who don't get access to education. And at least in India, I know for sure, it's predominantly because um, a lot of the rural areas are still farming lands and the farmers need hands, right? And and they would rather have, have deploy their kids in the, on the fields than investing in their education because it's expensive to educate when you don't have meals to eat, right? So what we're now doing is through our profits, whatever profits we make our investments, a big portion of that is going towards uh, sponsoring these kids' education. Hmm. It doesn't take much, to be honest. Uh, K through 12 for a child, depending upon how the organization is defined, you need only $500 for a child per year. Wow. Right? Yeah. So you're basically saying if for $6,000, is it 6000 Maybe 6000 Um 500 times 12. So, uh, so for $60,000, you can take care of the entire child's education. Right, and if you look at our returns and and the investments that we're doing, that number is not is not insignificant, but it's not hard to achieve. Right. right? Uh, if you again did your deployed your money correctly and your your investments are making sense, it's easy to carve out some portion of your money to go towards education. And the reason why we're doing this is one could say, why aren't you going the donation route? Right. I could I could raise money um, for donations. Quick backstory, back in 2008, me and my wife were trying to figure out what our life is all about, and we actually sold everything except a few rental properties in the U.S., and we moved into a monastery in India, an ashram in India, and we were living with monks. Oh, and wow. our, whole purpose was, our whole purpose was to, we can give money or we can give time. We wanted to give our time so that we can feel, right? We can, we can experience the life and the pain that uh, to the community that we were trying to serve. And that experience was about two years, and that had stayed with us. We we lost it a little bit when we came back. I think I got lost in the in the um, rigor of making money and making it making myself successful. However, I defined success at that time. But recently, during the COVID, I've lost several of my family members. About um, and my sister, who was two years older than me, then followed by my mom, also lost about three uncles, and I think. Uh, I had to pause. I had to pause to realize what is life trying to teach me. Right? There's yeah. something. There's something missing in my life that I'm feeling this much pain, feeling this much sorrow, and I kept coming back to we're not we're not making an impact in the world. Right? We're living our individualistic life, which is fine, and uh, we've been privileged with that life. But what exactly are we looking for? If we were, if I were to pass away tomorrow, what did we do? Right? Yeah, we made some money, but that's it. Uh, is that what life is all about? And me and my wife had a lot of brainstorming sessions and some retreats that we went to to kind of figure that thing out for us. And it kept coming back. We need to figure out how to use our money to add value in somebody else's life. Now, they, they don't need to know us. They don't need to remember us. But we need to make sure our money is being used to not only taking care of our lives, but also helping, uh, helping other families. Elevate from poverty, right? So we're, we have a we have a whole mission to say, grow big to give big, right? Yeah. So you want to make money, and you want to make your money because what we're not saying is live a life of a hermit because I've lived it. 
it's not easy. Um, so that's not a life that for everyone. Right. And I'm, 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 I'm amazed at people who do that. That's not a life for me. For most of us, it won't be the life. So how can we combine that too? But we also don't want us to wait, people to wait till they're 90 and 100 or 110 when they feel they need to give. It's too late. It could be too late, right? Um, and and if, you, if you can figure out to marry philanthropy, and uh, I wouldn't look at philanthropy as feel good thing. It's mm-hmm. really make it as an expense item. It's like a utility bill. Right? Yeah. That you, you figure that out in your life that, hey, I want to do that. I'm going to do that, period. And once you do that, if it's not an after effect of thought, and that's why we're not looking at donations because donation is always after effect. Because they always say charity begins at home, right? Uh, donation begins at home. So if, if you have a problem in your home, you're going to stop that pledge no matter how hard you, or no matter why you made that pledge. But if you don't have food f- food on your table, mm-hmm. you're not going to give $1,000 away to a child in India or wherever you pick or whatever cause you pick. You're going to say, I'm going to wait. And that that one withdrawal of that pledge has such a downstream impact on somebody else's life that you told a child you're going to sponsor their education, but something else happened in your life, and now you cut off that 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 uh, feeding tube. And now what are they going to do next year? They're going to go back to the field, right? right? That's what we don't want. What we want to make sure is there's consistency in that in that pledge, and that can only happen if we if we marry the capitalism along with philanthropy. So you make money. Making money is great because it 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 buys you a lot of things, right? But there's also it's also important to know what it cannot buy, and it cannot buy impact. It cannot buy other things, uh, happiness. Uh, so we want to make sure we can marry the two together. We're launching a nonprofit in the next few months here, which is going to be essentially built around our investments. As one of the key pillars of our success is going to be how many kids have we impacted. Our goal is to touch. 100,000 lives by 20, 2030. We're far, we're far from our goal, yeah. but that's the goal that we wake up to every morning and we'll continue that path. <clears throat> yeah, I have no doubt, uh, no doubt you'll get there. Um, some, some great points and uh, love the fact that uh, you're taking your success and, you know, reaching back and helping uh, some, some, of the, some of the folks with what helped you, that education. So That's what life is about, man. That's for what sure. life is about. Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly right. Well, Socket, I know we're running a little bit long here. And uh, so I wanted to uh, just kind of uh, have you talk a little bit about how people could uh, find out a little bit more about you. Yeah. So I have my own podcast, uh, Migrate to Wealth. Um, That's been doing fairly well, where we basically share similar stories on how to create holistic wealth. Our purpose is to, I have lived the life of just being finance is my single focus. And I know how painful that journey is. And I'm trying to make sure that I can, if, I, if people can learn from my mistakes and I can be a resource to them and help them bring some balance in their, their mind, their body, their relationship, the money and the contribution. We're trying to create, um, I'm trying to still figure out what the right term is, but really essentially trying to create five dimensional human beings, right? The mind, body, relationship, money, and your contributions. We want to bring it all together so you can live a more fulfilled life. So you can find me there. I have an, I'm on LinkedIn, Instagram. If you look at my name, Saki Jane, there's, not, there's very few of us. Uh, so I'm pretty sure you can find me. Um, and we'll make sure, Keith, that we give you those links so that people can connect with me. All right. So I've got just a question that, I, that I'm curious about. Um, and I think, yeah, uh, I think it was uh, Trevor McGregor who uh, mentioned it uh, when he talked about you. He said they call you Socket Rocket. And I imagine yes. it's because you've taken off, but it just. <laughs> so the story is not that. The story <laughs> is my God, and, and maybe it's not appropriate for your uh, for your audience. So, but we'll, we'll talk about a story. My name got butchered a lot. Right? So when I came to this country, um, so depending, I mean, you can use my, you can butcher this name in a lot of different ways. So one of the ways it was not necessarily the most appropriate way. And he said, something it baby, right? For my managers. <laughs> and I told him, look, I don't know how to respond to it. I'm so new to this country. I'm like, you can laugh at it. I'll get a laugh from it, but I actually don't know how to respond to it, yeah. right? And the more I, and I was in sales, I started realizing that not just my accent, it's just my name, right? So I need to figure out a way where, where I can, that I can, A, rem- people can remember my name, that's one. 
The second is more that they may have Americanized the name, but they are not butchering it completely. Yeah. Um, so one of my MBA professors, she started, she started calling me Rocket. And I'm like, you know what? That's actually a very interesting way. Socket the Rocket or Socket like a Rocket, whichever we want to pick, but Socket and Rocket, you cannot make a whole lot of mistake there. Right. That's right. really how the name, that's how the name got picked up, man. Uh, but yeah, now Trevor always says that's uh, Rocket like a Socket now. <laughs> so uh, that's a completely different, different meaning. That's not how, what, what it was meant for. Okay. For okay. Sure. Yeah. Just to help with the uh, pronunciation. <laughs> awesome. That was the goal, man. But I love that now. It's it's easier for me. I mean, that's become my that's has become second nature now. I introduce myself as not a sake gen, sake the rocket. Awesome. One one uh, one last question for you. Um, you know, we got a lot of folks that uh, are kind of at the beginning journey um, of building uh, their wealth and uh, in, in getting into. Um, you know, this type of investing. Um, is there something that uh, you um, maybe wish you would have done sooner, something that uh, you could recommend uh, for some folks that are in a similar spot? Yeah, I, I think I wish I asked the right questions or different questions. When I was, when I came to this country, I asked the question, how can I fit in? Hmm. And the question was, how can I stand out? Ah, yeah, I'd like it. The answer, the answer would have been very different. Yeah. And uh, that's my goal right now. How can I, not because I want publicity, not because it's fame, it's a different question. How can I add value, right? Uh, instead of how can I extract value? Because when I came here, I'm like, how can I find the best job that can give the most amount of money? The value is not even in the question. Yeah. Now, I think if I ask the question differently, how can I be of service to everybody that I touch? And, uh, and then how can I monetize it? Right? Yeah. Two different questions, but a very different way of looking at it. I, I was telling a coworker of mine, I think we talked about it, that I get up in the morning and I'm not dreading that I have to go to work, I have to work hard, or uh, December 2nd is when I quit my job. December 3rd is when I decided, when we decided, me and my wife, that we're going to travel to Hawaii. December 8th, we were in Hawaii for 22 days. I didn't have my laptop. Nice. My first vacation ever that I've done that, right? Because I've always been a consultant. And as a consultant, um, when the, when your clients have Christmas break, you don't. Yeah. Uh, you're working, right? There's, uh, as a sales professional, if you need to be somewhere, you need to be there. It doesn't matter what's happening at home. That's it right. It could be your kid's birthday. It could be your your wife may be delivering. Who knows what's happening? When, when the client calls, you got to show up. Right. Now I control my own schedule. I had my kids at three weeks of spring break. I canceled every single meeting. I didn't even care who gets offended. I'm like, look, if you can't, re if you can't reschedule, that's fine. I understand it. Um, but I can't take a meeting. I cannot do that at work when I was nine to five. There was no freedom. Yeah. Right? And that's really what I would say that when I ask the question, where can I add value? I can add value the way I can add value if I'm happy. Yeah. Right. And the only way I'm going to be happy is if I'm building time and memories with my family. Otherwise, I'm not going to be a good dad. I'm not going to be a good producer. I'm not going to be a good contributor. Uh, so I need to balance it all out. So I think that balancing would have happened. All, and I still go off balance every now and then. Uh, that's why I have my wife to remind me every single day. Right. That I'm going off balance, which is a great grounding experience, right? Uh, I don't like hearing it, but it's true. Um, and then that would have happened much earlier if I asked a different question. For sure. Oh, that's another another golden golden nugget here. So I uh, appreciate uh, your time, Socket. I really do. Um, I was looking forward to this and uh, it was uh, even better than I had expected. So really appreciate you. Thank you for having me, Keith. Appreciate it, buddy. All right. Thanks. Being that you're still here, I trust and found value in this episode. I personally wish I would have known these guests and strategies when I started my wealth creation journey. Go to wealthflow.capital to subscribe to our newsletter. And as a free gift, we will send you our quarterly market report and the top 10 things to look for in an investment opportunity. Take a minute to give our show a rating and review. Help us reach a million professionals by subscribing and sharing this episode with someone you know who could also find value in it.